Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Business Builder Show. I'm your host, Marty Wolf. If you're looking on the screen, you'll see Kate O'Neill. I'm honored to have her as our guest today. Hi, Kate. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you, Marty? This is terrific. Uh, glad to be uh, back on the Business Builder Show. We've taken a little time off, but uh, I waited till the right guest to have to bring back the <laughs> Business Builder Show, and that is absolutely Kate O'Neill. And let me do a brief introduction. And we're going to talk about her book and all the great things that she's involved with. So, Kate O'Neill helps leaders create meaningful human experiences in a tech-driven world and take responsibility for the future we all share. She is founder and CEO of KO Insights, a strategic advisory firm providing big picture thinking on how business, humanity, and technology interact at scale and committed to improving human experience and a, and a human experience amid exponential change. Um, Kate, it was some time ago you were on the show, and we talked about your other book, which was Tech Humanist. That's Great right. Book. Great Thank book. Great book. I loved it. And so now, today, we're going to talk about your new book. Here it is, folks. The title is A, a Future So Bright. Subtitled, How Strategic Optimism and meaningful innovation can restore our humanity and save the world. Holy (laughs) moly. I I guess, I guess that's the way to launch Kate. So, so much to talk about. No small efforts. No, no, small. no, let's, let's go all the way, you know, let's go all the way. Um, The book is great. There's no way we're going to cover everything in the book, uh, business builder show audience, uh, I'm going to hit on as many things as I possibly can. Um, but, uh, Kate, let's start this way. Uh, you use the word strategic optimism several times in the book and, and, uh, and in your teaching. So maybe we should start there. Give us a definition of what you mean by strategic optimism. Well, thanks for the opportunity. And it's, it is really good to be back on your show. I'm so glad that you've uh, invited me back. I am, um, I am an optimist, uh, but I think one of the things that optimism is often uh, criticized for is that it seems to people as if it's naive and um, unthinking and unserious. And I actually feel like the greatest opportunity for optimism is to recognize, to use it fully to recognize what's going on in actuality in the world around you and then Mm -hmm. take a very strategic view in leaning into the best possible outcomes. I feel like a lot of times, especially in in business, we do a lot of worst case scenario planning. We think a lot about what could go wrong. We do a lot of risk mitigation and planning for, for all of those possibilities, but we don't necessarily sit and think, how do we make sure that this goes right? How do we lean into the the best possible scenario and and what could go what happens if it goes really really well and now we haven't planned for the scale that we probably are going to achieve or that we might achieve uh, and things can fail that way too. So there there's an opportunity I think to use a combined view of an optimism uh, optimism that's very clear-eyed uh, yeah. along with a strategy that leans into the best possible outcome. So it's both a model and a mindset. Yeah, well, I don't want to go negative right out of the gate <laughs> because you're right. I, I work with a lot of clients and quite frankly, a lot of our discussions are about what can go wrong and I understand that. But you are right and I completely agree that we don't talk enough about, well, what are we going to do? What will it look like if everything goes right? So right. I've already shared this book with some of my clients to say, look, I want you to read this before I, I get back to you because I want to talk about this stuff. Uh, but to go to the, neg- the negative part of it, you know, th- you address and you talk about a lot of challenges that we have that we are dealing with that we can use strategic optimism. Um, so what are some of the biggest challenges or you call them change factors that uh, you talk about in the book? Let's kind of cover those quickly. Well, I think we're all kind of, you know, steeped in it, right? We know that we're dealing with climate crisis, climate emergency. We know that that is one of the most urgent and imminent situations that we all live within. Uh, and, and then of course we, we have the, uh, the pandemic that we're living within as well. So sure. we have two very big exponential kinds of change factors around us and they, they create, you know, these kind of existential threats to us. And in addition to those, I think especially within the realm of business, we think a lot about 
artificial intelligence and the future of automated intelligence and what that means for jobs of the future and the workplace yeah. of the future. And so that's creating a lot of uncertainty and a lot of things that people don't really understand, you know, what that's going to look like five, 10 years down the road. Mm -hmm. And then I think there's a lot of other things too, like the, the sort of political upheaval within the U S you know, we have a lot of partisan political upheaval and rancor, but there's geopolitical upheaval and there's a lot of financial instability, partly owing to the, the, uh, the, sorry, the pandemic, um, there's um, the, mis the, the misinformation and disinformation pandemic that's also happening and causing breaches in trust and, and uh, a lot of issues around privacy. There's a lot of cyber fraud. There's, there's just, you know, you could go on and on. It feels like there are just an awful lot of problems at scale that are really mm. happening across the board for, for all of us. And I think those, those create an overwhelming amount of yeah. uh, dissonance for people. And I think trying to figure out how to plan strategically in a business environment in particular, uh, when it feels disconnected from those realities, if you're, if you're trying to just kind of hit quarterly goals, selling a widget or, you know, doing whatever right. you do, I think people can feel a little disconnected from the greater and larger realities that they live within. So the opportunity I think is to, to really address the the truth of and the reality of that world we live in and find alignment with it. So I've uh, I've created a few opportunities I, I think throughout the book to say, yeah. hey, look, we have to we have to be very clear eyed about this. We can use models. I know that you know you were um, in our, our pre discussion talking about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is one sure. one framework that I offer that I think businesses in particular can look to. Mm -hmm. To say, hey, how do we make sure that our work is aligned with something that actually makes sense for the good of humanity so we can feel good about it? So we can, you know, bring all of ourselves, all of our energy and all of our human spirit to work and not just be kind of feeling like, okay, we, we clocked in. So now we have to not care about the climate crisis anymore. We have to not care about misinformation. We have to not care about all these other factors because they aren't what's on my to-do list today. Yeah. And I think we, we need to do better than that. Yeah, there's a lot of anxiety in our world. Uh, there's no doubt about it. What That's one of the things I really like about your book, and you cover a whole lot of topics. Um, I, I hope you're not offended by me calling it somewhat of a playbook. Oh, yeah. Um, oh. I, I like that. I like the idea. You, you co cover a topic and you say, okay, here's, uh, here's some facts and here's some things you may want to think about individually and at scale. And I like that mixture of how you did that on each on several topics. Thank you. Yeah, it was important to me because my work as a speaker and an advisor has been in front of a lot of different types of audiences, like cities and corporate yeah. leaders and, and you know, different types of entities, museums, um, uh, associations, representing a lot of different industries and right. audience types. And so I felt it was really important for people to find inspiration, draw inspiration from a variety of sources. So my city leader audiences are probably going to be immediately drawn to the future of cities area of the book. Correct. But I'm really hoping that they'll also see some inspiration from the things that are discussed in the, the future of privacy or the future of trust or, you know, where businesses can use AI at scale to, to solve climate problems and, and other kinds of human challenges at scale while addressing their own business opportunities. Yeah, I'm going to bring up a couple of topics that are in the book that I like. Cities is one of them. I want to go a little deeper on that. We we kind of exchanged LinkedIn things that you saw me mention that. Um, but, um, well, here's another thing that I like about the book. On page 26, you actually have a model for strategic optimism. And it's on page 26, and it's uh, uh, brighter. It's <laughs> it's follows the word brighter. Can, can you address that a little bit and tell us what brighter stands for and maybe go a little deeper on all that? Sure. You know, it's funny. I, I have a little footnote in the book that says I genuinely hate the kinds of acronyms <laughs> that people I'm sorry. use. <clears throat> right? I, I just, I really do. I think whenever it's so contrived, whenever anybody comes up with something like this. But I was like, you know, I'm willing to do anything. You gotta do it. <laughs> if this is going to help make this make sense. It does. Is, yeah. It does, Kate. It does. <laughs> Go so, for it. Tell so, us yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah. So brighter uh, is it, it genuinely feels like there's there's this kind of seven or eight sequence or step sequence that you you have to kind of go through as you think about how to live in this world of both strategy and optimism. And I should back up and, and just one thing say one sure. thing that in case your viewers 
uh, it, it might make or, or listeners too, it might make a little more sense if I unpack one idea, which is that, um, you know, one of the things I talk about early on in the book is that a lot of times the way we talk about the future is unnecessarily binary, right? Like we we have in in our society, in literature and culture, a way of talking about the future that is rooted in this dichotomy of dystopia versus utopia. And mm -hmm. I think everybody seems like whenever I say that, they go like, oh yeah, that's true, right? Like we never ever talk about anything other than dystopia or utopia. When it One extreme to or the other. Right, right. And yeah. we all know that utopia is not an option. <laughs> Like no one believes that. So now we're only talking about shades of dystopia. And I feel like that's an incredibly disheartening and unuseful way of thinking about the future. So mm -hmm. I'm offering a new way to say, you know, it's both and first of all, like we're going to have good and bad all the time. That's what life is. That's what the reality is. So I think it's really important to address that first, that strategic optimism is very aware of the fact that, you know, we have good and bad all around us. So the first step in all of this is to be honest, that the B stands for be honest about the fullness of the situation, like everything that's going on around you, even if it initially looks bleak, it's super important to size up what's going on. And then the R is recognize what matters, which incidentally is meaning. And meaning is a really fundamental human construct, which I unpack mm -hmm. in the book. And then the I stands for identify what is going to matter. And that is where innovation comes in. So I'm, I'm using this model that says, if meaning is about what matters, then innovation can be said to be about what is going to matter. And you mm -hmm. can extend this very human centric understanding into that's innovation. Great. Yeah. So I think that's a really powerful, those, even just those three pieces of the model are super powerful for people working mm -hmm. around the innovation space. Mm -hmm. And then G I, I say is go all in on hope as a tool of focus and refocus. I find that hope is a really clarifying tool. It's a lens that we look through to say, what is it that we're actually trying to achieve? What do we want to have happen? And then five, the, the H stands for um, habituate, <laughs> which is kind of a funny little joke to myself, but habituate to change because it means get used to it. Like we have change happening all the time. It's not enough to say change is happening, adapt to change. Like I think we actually have to like get ourselves used to the idea yeah. that change is ever present and ongoing and we are not going to be done with change. We are going to be living yeah. in an ever accelerating amount of change. So we got to get used to it. Yep. Then the, the T stands for tune in with empathy because I think empathy is a really key way to anticipate what needs to change ahead of us. And then E is envision bold ways forward. That's a super powerful piece of this. Like what can we do? And then one of the key, the pieces that's leading into this R, the last piece of the model, one of the key understandings is that once we envision those bold ways forward, once we see what can actually happen, the, the, the work of strategic optimism is that we have to commit to achieving them. So that yep. R is resolved to work toward yeah. the best futures for the most people. Like that's best, futures, best, best futures, best futures for, for the, the most, most people. people. How many times do I say book. that? Uh, I <laughs> should have counted 30, them. 30 times or so. Yeah. It's uh, at least I, I, I got really it. Important. I wrote it in my notes, but I'm, I'm, go I'm going to come back to something. You mentioned the word hope. Mm. And I'm going to light your fire with this comment because I know you won't have something to say about this. You hear business people say all the time, hope is not a strategy. <laughs> how do you feel about that? <laughs> Am I pretty clear in the book about how I feel about that? Yeah. Tell me it, about that, Kate. <laughs> it's it's funny because it, it actually um, it is a pet peeve of mine. I feel like the um, it's a very dismissive sort of statement about hope, that hope is not a strategy, whereas – the implication seems to be what? What is then? Is 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 pessimism supposed to be a strategy? Like, what are you saying? Hope yeah. obviously is not a strategy. Hope on on its own is not what we're using to to solve human problems at scale. It's hope is what we're using to tell us what it is we think could happen, and then we're using strategy. We're using planning. We're using our intellect to say, here's how we can actually lay a course ahead of us to achieve that which we think could happen. So that's that strategic optimism, the tension of it, the both and of it. The both and, and that's the other phrase you use often through all of it. I love that. I've been talking about that thought process for years and years and years with clients okay. because they do get locked in. They go, well, you know, there's only one way to do this. No, 
No, there isn't really. Yeah. No, there's, there's options here, you know, so let's think about that. So let's move on to, uh, I think it's chapter 11, and the chapter 11 title says, The Roadmap to a More Just Future has already been created. And this is where you talk about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Tell us more about that and why did you incorporate it into your book? Yeah, you know, I, I can't remember when it was that I first got introduced to these goals, but they are um, a set of 17 goals that the United Nations created in uh, in. 2015, I believe, yeah, September 2015, to be uh, measurably improved by 2030. So this decade that we're in, the 20 in 2021, the 2020s, are meant to be the decade of action toward the 2030 deadline of sorts, uh, right. by which we're supposed to have made measurable improvement in these 17 areas. And those 17 areas are things like no poverty, um, zero hunger, um, quality education, gender equality clean water and sanitation. So it, it's it's a lot of different kinds of things. It's about life on air, I mean, life on land, life, uh, quality of life underwater right. and uh, the quality of the oceans and air quality. And um, right. it's also about things like um, infrastructure and integration of, of different types of uh, infrastructure and smart cities and making sure that they're well poised. So it's a, it covers a lot of ground. And what I think is really important about that is that when I present this to business leaders, my my uh, observation and, and challenge to business leaders is you are probably working in some space, some area that is covered by one of these 17 goals, almost yeah. for sure, right? Like almost for sure. Yep. Something you're doing has some kind of tie in here. Sure. And so it's an em enormous opportunity for you to figure out how you align with one of these and push that area forward, really intentionally be aligned with the good of humanity, like what's going to be good for all human life and all life on the planet. And I think that I hear so often from CEOs, you probably do too, that they feel a, a, a sort of disconnect sometimes. Leaders, I think, often feel a disconnect that we want to do good. We we want to be able to to lead well and and serve humanity, and also we feel a lot of pressures from stakeholders around us and the 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 externalities of the market or of the board or of whatever the the situation is. And my my plea to leaders is always, I think that you're correct, and I feel I sympathize and empathize with your situation, and I also think that you're not looking clearly enough at the opportunity that's in front of you, because there is an integrative opportunity for you to bring solving problems at scale, solving human problems at scale into your mission and make it authentically, genuinely part of what you're doing, because there is an opportunity to align your existing work with one of these 17 goals and, and move in that direction. You include it, you connect some of the topics or discussions that you have in the book through those goals. I love the way you blended that back and forth uh, as leaders read it. And you do point out uh, in the book that if you're reading this, you are a leader. Even if you're a frontline factory worker, you are a leader. You're thinking about this, you're reading this book. So my guest, I want to make sure you know, my guest is Kate O'Neill. Her company is KO Insights. Yes, it's koinsights.com. Her book is A Future So Bright. I think we're talking about a future so bright. And the subtitle, I think, is really important. How strategic optimism and meaningful innovation can restore our humanity and save our world. So, Kate, I'm going to get technical for a minute because <laughs> that's a big part of your world. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I actually think it's actual uh, a title, one of the chapters or one of the pages it deals with. And so I want to ask you the question. Uh, it's on everybody's, most everybody's words, especially in business, uh, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. AI, machine learning, AR, uh, augmented reality, all these other kinds of things. And you address some of these things like, well, how, how can this, these things be, uh, help us do good things? So talk to me about that. Well, I think there's a couple of things that are important about AI and emerging technologies in particular. One is that by their very nature, they bring amount about a tremendous amount of capacity and scale that we have never had before. So mm -hmm. 
sort of by their very nature, we're ethically bound to try to address what is it we're going to do with that added capacity and scale? Are we simply going to feed it back into the systems we already have and press for more and more profit and more and more growth and more and more, you know, is it going to be that? Or are we going to be more thoughtful? Are we going to step back from that system and say, what could we actually do with this capacity? What could we do that would set ourselves up and set future generations up for a better quality of life. And so it turns out that you could actually use artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies in alignment with every single one of those sustainable development goals. And I, mm -hmm. you could say maybe even tediously went through and made a list <laughs> of some examples that I've paid attention to over the years. So I've been collecting these examples for years now um, of of proofs of concept of artificial intelligence projects, actual yeah. artificial intelligence projects that are aligned with each of these goals. So they're things like, um, you know, detecting cancer, uh, which is aligned with goal three, good health and well-being, or um, helping blind people navigate independently, which is also the, the same goal, or reduce, reducing herbicide use. That's something that's huge in agriculture, trying to figure out how to use AI to, to understand soil uh, optimization and uh, that aligns with zero hunger, but it also aligns with um, the quality of, of land and, and making sure that we're um, not polluting waters and, and air quality and things like that. So I mean, it's it's a pretty intense challenge, but I think what it what it what it the opportunity it presents is for business leaders to think again integratively about technology and for technology innovators to think in a really progressive way about what could this technology do that we now have an opportunity to do, we didn't, we never had the opportunity before. We yeah. may have had the opportunity before, but we certainly have it now. As we lean into this, this, uh, this new era, we just, right. we have this chance. So I, I'm just imploring leaders to take the, a, a step back and think, what could we do with this that's responsible, that's ethical, and that actually moves humanity forward as opposed to, you know, simply furthering the uh, the use of of data and um, you know personal data and algorithmic optimization yeah. to try to sell more and more widgets to people. I mean, there there comes a point when that's just not meaningful as as much anymore. Yeah, you make the point in the book, so I want to make sure that we make the point here is that all these things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all these things that you're talking about and the list that you had, we put that together intentionally, right? Okay, I mean that. It doesn't fall from the sky, although we think it falls from the sky because we may just be recipients of that and we don't realize how much we already are recipients of AI. But we decide being we, uh, the decisions we make, businesses, leaders, cities, you design what people are going to use and apply, correct? Yes. Yeah. One of, the, one of my phrases that I've been saying for years is machines are what we encode of ourselves. And I think mm. it's really important that we recognize that, that it, it is our biases as well as our values. Uh, so there's a, there's a very complex picture to unpack there and make sure that we're using machines for the best possible futures for the most people. That That is an important ethical obligation. We've done a lot to say, uh, to, to build data sets in, in our own uh, image, in a sense. Like we've said, we think that these are the meaningful data pieces of data to collect. In business, we determine around the shape of our business what data we're going to collect and how we're going to optimize the business. And it's Correct. no coincidence then when we build automated systems that optimize around those data sets, that optimize around what we've determined to be the priorities. So this is the challenge, is to say, are we setting the right priorities? Are we actually acknowledging people at their at their fullest? Are we saying we've got the most inclusive lens on what humanity is? And are we serving all the communities, all the constituents who are touched by the products mm. we make, the services that we provide? Are we sure that we're doing that responsibly? And if we are, then by all means, artificial intelligence and automation are going to be amazing at accelerating that. I just think yeah. it's important that we've made sure to, to take that step and ask those questions before we apply uh, automated intelligence to that process. 
Yes, we decide our future more than we realize. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, again, some of us are sitting back. You're not, I'm not. Um, I have people like you on to talk about these things. I do want to save the world in whatever capacity I can. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can, um, you know, by having the show and everything else. Let's switch to cities. I found that, again, Kate in her book talks about cities, businesses, government, NGOs, a whole bunch of other folks that are all these things are connected to to her topics but okay talk to me uh, about there's a chapter or part of the book that talks about cities getting ready to lead let's go a little deeper on that for me yeah one of the really interesting uh aspects of the research i kept i kept finding or the research, the findings i kept encountering in my research i suppose is one way to say it uh, is that cities are increasingly becoming important in setting the agenda for humanity. So um, yeah. most of the economic might is in cities. A lot of the growth that we can expect is going to be happening, population growth and, and otherwise is going to be happening in cities over the decades to come. Um, we have seen some shakeup about the growth of cities when it comes to COVID in the last you know year and a half or so. There's been some right. some people moving out of cities because they feel like you know they wanted to get away to um, you know some sort of place that had some land and some some yard or whatever. Um, but then there's been some flow back into cities uh, since things began opening back up. So I think we're we can discount the last year and a half a little bit as an anomaly. Yeah. Uh, and, and really look at what it means when we think about the future of remote work and distributed work and how that's going to shape things. But people are going to be drawn to cities in the future, just as people have been drawn to cities in the past. And uh, we need to, to prepare cities to be very successful at setting this agenda. So one of the things that I was able to do uh, with my team of researchers is find a lot of different kinds of examples of cities all around the world, cities yeah. of different sizes, who are doing really interesting and, and progressive things around uh, climate policy, who are um, setting city planning agendas that are inclusive and that are uh, um, that build back into the cities and make sure that there are economic opportunities, that businesses yeah. have incentives to, to um, provide jobs to local uh, communities, that, um, that they're tied into initiatives that are trying to um, amplify BIPOC communities and making sure that that, that people of color are, are given um, oper ample opportunity to lead yep. and be part of these discussions at the table. So there's just there's a really cool set of, of examples that I think are, are really instructive for yep. business leaders um, and as well as like they're not disconnected from business. An awful lot of these examples are about public private partnerships and about how, Absolutely. how cities and businesses have worked together to do things like the clean charge network in Kansas City is one example that pops to mind where um, it's a it's a network of charging stations and that's been heavily uh, a, a partnership between the utility company and private companies across the city who have been partners in putting charging stations in front of you know shopping malls and and movie theaters and restaurants and so on so i think when you think about it that way i mean it's a whole interwoven opportunity and yeah. the more integratively we can think about this kind of thing the bigger the opportunities are I have a very selfish reason for asking that question because I'm seeing changes in my own little community. And uh, I want to make sure that uh, the folks who can do some of these things in my region uh, watch this interview. So I'm selfish in, in that and sharing your, what you just shared with me and, and sharing with our Business Builder Show audience. Moving on to another topic that, again, selfishly, I'm going to talk about these. Uh, tell me more about a brighter future for how and what we eat. Oh, yes, I yes. found that fascinating you... uh, again selfishly because i'm connected to uh, an organization called the rodale institute mm -hmm. which is in pennsylvania um and they are very big into regenerative agriculture and all those kinds of things look them up i'll connect you to them at some point but tell That's me great. what you wrote about in your book about how and what we well as the more i dug into um mitigating climate emergency, the more I found uh, lots and lots of research toward um, the the food that we consume, the way we use agricultural land, uh, and the, the sort of trade-off of eating meat versus eating plants and things like that. So a very strong, heavy bias in research toward 
um, vegan and plant-based diets. And uh, I, it's fun. It was funny for me because I've been vegan since '98, and I wanted to be sure that I wasn't injecting my own bias too much in selecting the studies yeah. that would reinforce that. But yeah. it was just again and again, and my own my team of researchers kept coming up with this stuff, and I was just like, "All right, I'm going to yeah. cover it." <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> it's again, there. I, I I think that's important to what you just said is. Uh, I don't think I've said it on this show, but I've said it in my LinkedIn post that what I really love about your work and other people that have been on the show is the research. You mentioned your team of research and your personal experiences through all your speaking, through all your writing is that, you know, it's just it's just credible to me. You know, the work that you're doing, the book you're writing, the speaking that you're doing. Um, it just, it just helps you, it, it, it makes you so much more credible. By the way, there's all kinds of footnotes in there validating, right? Right. Kate? Lots of footnotes, <laughs> lots of footnotes in there. So, but that, that's really important, uh, for me at least, you know, to have, when I have guests on, uh, I want, uh, people to know that. So the, the question that kind of start to wrap up is, so what is it that you want people to remember about this discussion? And maybe the second part is what actions, specific actions, would you like to see people take as a result of this uh, interview and as a result of reading your book? That's that's such a wonderful summary question, and I appreciate it. I, I think that the most important thing that I want people to take away from this book is a fundamental understanding of meaning as a human superpower and that as a as a way of processing what we do now and into the future. Meaning instructs us about what's important, what matters right now, and it's a useful tool for thinking about innovation in terms of what's going to matter. I think that's n the step one and two. And then I think that people also uh, have the opportunity to think about the impact that they have, to think about you know not just what they want to see happen, but how they can actually make things happen. And for business leaders in particular, that has to do with aligning with the SDGs. Uh, so there's going to be tremendous opportunity to ask questions of yourself and of your organization about how to make sure that you're making changes at scale that align with meaningful human experiences and with solving human problems at scale. So those are the big yeah. things. And then I, I mean, I just think that we we have such an opportunity ahead of us to be radically strategic and bold. And I, I really hope that people take that opportunity. Oh, yes, let's do it. I agree. The future is so bright. <laughs> I have to put my shades on. I mean, this, this conversation and this book has been so fantastic. My, my guest, again, is Kate O'Neill. Her book is A Future So Bright, Subtitle, How Strategic Optimism and Meaningful Innovation Can Restore Our Humanity and Save the World. Go to koinsights.com, hire her as a speaker, as a facilitator, read her books, jump in, let's make a difference. So Kate O'Neill, thank you so much for being part of the Business Builder Show. Thank you, Marty.